Hello everyone and welcome back to Space Basics. In this video I'm going to discuss how to travel to the moon, how to make the lunar transfer from low Earth orbit. And first of all we have to make sure that we line up properly with the moon similarly to how we lined up with targets in low Earth orbit. But we're going to talk about multiple methods of getting to the moon because of where you happen to be. Here we are at Cape Canaveral with the Saturn V rocket with Apollo on top, as you might expect for this particular purpose, uh, since it did in fact travel to the moon. And without targeting the moon, I'm going to talk about how to eyeball it, which is, uh, this is the case if you do not have the ability to figure out your relative inclination to it and optimize the launch window. Uh, you could figure it out by sort of turning the camera and then guesstimating. So I'm going to try the guesstimation way first. And in order to understand how this works, we'll talk about how our orbit's going to end up. We're going to launch from, uh, it says Kerbal Space Center, but it's Kennedy Space Center. And we're going to launch southward. And so we're going to just go with the natural inclination out of the Space Center, which means we're going to go down to the equator. And then somewhere around here, we got to cross the equator and then we'll be at the uh, opposite latitude, uh, so 28, point, uh, 28 degrees 37 minutes south, and then it's got to come back up again. But the point is, is that our current location is going to be the highest latitude of our orbit. Uh, that it, it is going to be the highest it's going to be if we go launch normally. If we launched into a higher inclination, then there will be a higher point in our orbit latitude-wise but we're just gonna go normally. And so if this is the highest point in our orbit, then what we need is to make sure that this point is facing the highest point in the moon's orbit. Now, if we take a look, if we try to line up the moon's, uh, the two legs of the moon's orbit here, uh, we'll see that eventually it seems to flatten out if I turn the camera like this, but then there's also a point where it's at its maximum. And sort of around here-ish where it actually happens to be, conveniently enough. But that's about where it seems to be at its maximum inclination. And what we want to do is launch when we're directly under the, uh, the high point. So that's the high point. And we want our location to be directly under the high point. So let me time warp. Because it's also going to be our high point, right? And so at that point, the Space Center will seem to be directly on the horizon. And if I am right about this setup, then when I target the moon, our relative inclination should show something somewhat low. Uh, 8.79 is good. Let me just uh, time warp for a whole day. We're going to have some boil off though. Uh, but let me time warp for a whole day to show you how long it is. Uh, how bad it can get, and let me put it that way. Uh, so 8.76, you can see it's ticking down right now, and it'll tick down fairly quickly. Uh, let's get some sort of a clock here. 14.05 right now. And how far off were we? Just by eyeballing it. We were about an hour off. Now, Cape Canaveral, this location, is a special location for launching to the moon. Uh, its natural inclination happens to be more or less in line with the moon. Uh, so you can get a relative inclination only a quarter of a degree off. This is not true of other locations. If it, for any higher latitude, you are not going to be able to go directly to the moon like this. Uh, for any lower uh, latitude, I was going to say altitude, lower latitude, somewhere between 28 degrees north and 28 degrees south, you can end up going directly to the moon. Uh, but yeah, this is one of the lower locations in the United States and that is why it's here. <laughs> so it is possible to go directly to the moon and line up. So yeah, let me just time warp for a whole day and then we'll bring the rocket back out to the pad to solve the boil off. Uh, boil off is if you do not have fuel replenishment on the pad and this is a special pad, I don't have fuel replenishment on here. On the surface of the earth, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen turn into gas, they heat up, and they need to be vented out. So you'll see rockets like this have a lot of venting uh, going out as they, uh, the oxygen and hydrogen inside the tanks uh, turn into gas because of the heat. 
and the conduction from the atmosphere. In space, there's not much conduct. There's no conduction. There's no atmosphere. Well, there's a few little particles, but it's not much. So all you have to worry about is radiation, which is much, much less. And in fact, the boil off on the surface is counted in hours. The boil off in space is counted in months, basically percent by per month. Uh, so it's percent per hour down here. So you need to make sure it's hooked up to extra tanks. So when you vent it out, that you replenish the fuel, top it off. Uh, right now we're not topping it off. Anyway, you can see that uh, just two hours after the optimal point, we are already 14 degrees off. And the worst it gets is like 56. So eight degrees was not too bad, but it was not the best, but for eyeballing it, it's not too great. Anyway, I'm gonna bring the rocket back out to the pad and then we will get the right inclination and then we will launch and I'll talk about other things to deal with for transfer if you're in this kind of location. If you're in a higher location, we'll talk about that situation too. Okay, so I've brought the rocket back out at the right time. Let me just target the moon. We've got a low relative inclination and because I brought the rocket back out, we're pretty much topped off as far as boil off. If there is any boil off at all, I can assure you that that's going to cause problems for whether or not you have enough delta v to get to the moon. The margins are pretty tight here. Um, they're not as tight on the first stage, but uh, as long as you get to the right point with the first stage, you should be fine as long as there is hasn't been boil off on the upper stages. So we are getting boil off right now. You can see when it says 0. 0.4241, that's how much how many liters are going per second. So let's just get on with it. I'm going to use KOS to do the launch so I can talk during the same time without any hindrance. And also it'll be a more uh, reliable launch just in case I would have forgotten something. Okay, ignition. Could have probably waited another second before releasing the clamps there, but off we go. So one important thing about the Saturn V is it actually turns faster than people might think it does. And that's critical to ensuring that the first stage can do enough work in order to get the second and third stages with the delta V necessary to transfer to the moon. The third stage is the one that actually does the transfer to the moon. Uh, basically, the whole deal is determined by how the first stage works out. Uh, with the 8 degree difference that we had when I eyeballed it, uh, the first stage should be able to handle that. It should be able to correct to those 8 degrees on launch. In fact, uh, during the real launches to the moon, the first stage didn't actually go to 28.6 degrees, which is the natural inclination out of Cape Canaveral. It went to something like 32. And that was for multiple reasons, including the timing on arrival and the radiation belts. There's, when it comes to the launch window for the moon missions, the real Apollo program missions, there are a number of considerations. First of all, of course, it has to line up with the moon and have the right inclination and phase. Uh, the second thing was that they wanted to have the right lighting conditions at the landing location. And so they wanted the sun at a certain angle not directly overhead, but a sort of a grazing angle to cast large shadows so that if there's any boulders or uh, you know, edgy terrain, the astronauts would be able to see those and avoid them. So we had center engine cut out. The first stage uh, shuts off the center engine in order to limit G-forces in this case. With crew, generally you do not want more than four Gs of acceleration. Uh, that is the limit for jet tr uh, jet fighter trained pilots to reach controls basically. At 4G's it's still a push but at least they generally are able to reach controls with uh, acceleration of 4G's. Okay and that's the second stage. 
And what you see is our surface velocity was around 2,300 meters per second from the first stage. That's what we want. The first stage there did not use all of its fuel. It actually shut down prior to using all of its fuel. I've got all the shutdowns at the right time for the real Apollo 11 launch. So there is still some fuel there and it could have been used if necessary. And same with this stage, uh, you'll see that it'll shut down prior to consuming all of its fuel. On later missions, they will take more advantage, they would upgrade the engines and take more advantage of the capabilities of the Saturn V. So the rocket was actually heavier on later missions and they would carry stuff like the rover and uh, other uh, scientific equipment. So the lying conditions on the surface are one thing that they had to take into consideration. Another is the radiation belts and exactly how those are. They're not, they're not like spheres around the earth. Uh, they don't completely cover the Earth. They're actually toruses around the Earth, and so there are ways to sort of avoid them. That's one thing. You'd still pass through them, but the intensity varies as far as the actual radiation in the radiation belts. So you can sort of hit them at a happier spot, if you will. Uh, another thing is that you pass through them fairly quickly. The radiation belts around the Earth and around here-ish, uh, around there, I, I mean they are sort of vagueish blobs, uh, so they're not, they don't have wholly des uh, defined borders, but the idea is around the distance that you would have geostationary satellites is about where they are, a little bit beyond that. Uh, so it's not all the way to the moon or anything and you pass through them very quickly because this is the quick part of our orbit uh, right around here once we head out to the moon we'll be going 10,000 meters per second so that's the quick part of our orbit we'd pass through them uh, in a couple of hours and then it slows down progressively until we hit the moon's orbit at that point uh, we'll be going about uh, we'll be only going 176 meters per second and then we have to speed up we'd have to it's complicated we're going to have to slow down with reference to the moon, but speed up with reference to the Earth. So, it's sort of bizarre like that. We will talk more about frames of reference once we get into orbit, but because we haven't talked about that, that's one reason why I'm not doing this in uh, an install with Principia. And we'll talk about the difference between uh, this version of things and a version with n-body physics as well. Uh, here, I wonder if I should have the RCS ports here. These are called the Auxiliary Propulsion System, or APS. They help control the rocket when the engine isn't on. And I do wonder if I should have them activate to help avoid it pitching down like that. But for most of the second stage, we are between 19 and 29 degrees. And then for this stage, we will be slightly tilting up here. Uh, but here we are in the phase where it's just trying to keep its vertical speed close to zero. And so we're still sort of going down here. The target orbit for transferring to the moon. First of all, we get into low Earth orbit. I sort of forgot to mention that. We would like to first get into low Earth orbit and then wait in order to transfer to the moon. Trying to transfer directly uh, will narrow the launch window and your opportunities. So if you happen to not be able to launch on the right day, you can't just launch the next day or something like that. Um, so parking in low Earth orbit helps, though we'll talk about other ways to get to the moon other than this simplest one. This is the simplest one. Uh, this is the simplest way to get to the moon. Um, so we are going into low Earth orbit first, and that orbit will be roughly 200 kilometers in altitude. So, uh, and it'll be circular. It's pretty important for it to be circular. Uh, that helps with planning, though for Kerbal Space Program planning is relatively easy with our maneuver nodes and all that business, but for the purposes of calculating things in the 1960s, uh, having the orbit be as circular as possible is super helpful. The amount of delta V that we want left in the stage once we get to orbit in order to transfer to the moon is 3,200. Okay, well, we have our 3,200. Oh, it's a little bit more than that because the engine was gimbling. So we have a little bit of margin there. 
So, how do we plot for the moon? So the reason we get into a low Earth orbit first, and why that's easier, is because, well, we wanted to launch over here in order to ensure our inclination was correct, right? But if we take a look at where the moon is, which is over here right now, we are going to have to meet up with the moon where it's going to be after we make our transfer over. So it's going to take us some time to get out there, roughly three days. And we have to figure out where the moon is going to be in those three days to meet up with it. If we tried to uh, meet up with the moon where it is right now, it would have moved. So this is the top. This is going to be phase angle. Uh, the phase angle is the angle between uh, where the moon is right now and where it's going to be when we get there. And that angle, let's say, well, we can easily calculate it because the whole moon's orbit is 27 days. And the time it takes us to get there is three days and a half, 3.5 days. So if we uh, take our calculator, this is going to be painful though, 3.5 days divided by 27, I get basically 13%. And then we multiply that by 360, we get 46 degrees. So uh, I'm not going to write it out, but the time it takes for you to get to the target location divided by the target location's orbital period, okay, roughly speaking, multiply that by 360, and you get the degrees. So we're looking for about 45 degrees from where the moon is right now. So the moon is over there. A 45 degree angle from where the moon is, is where we want to hit it. Now, the direction opposite of that is where we boost up. So it's over here. And wherever you boost up from, it'll lift up the opposite side of your orbit. So what we expect is, well, that's not quite 45 degrees, is it? So we want it over there. So we take this node and we move it a little bit like that. And we boost up and we will expect an encounter. So whatever your target is, let's say it's some other object in high Earth orbit, it doesn't matter, you can, if, as long as you can check its period, and if you needed to check the period of the moon, uh, it's here. Well, the rotation period of the moon happens to be the same as its orbital period because it is tidally locked. In other words, one side is always facing the Earth. So it's 27 days, 6 hours, 50, uh, 35 minutes, and 44 seconds, if you want to be precise. Uh, so... But yeah, it happens to be about a 46 degree angle. Uh, you, uh, with the moon, it's... We'll talk about sphere of influence. Okay, sphere of influence. Uh, the moon's sphere of influence is large enough so that even if you're quite a bit off from that 46 degrees, it'll be fine. The moon will sort of suck you in. Now, what is sphere of influence? Well, sphere of influence is how we do things in stock Kerbal Space Program and how they did things in the 1960s for calculating orbits uh, during the Apollo program. And the idea is that we're going to divide up space between where the Earth's gravity is most dominant and where the Moon's gravity is most dominant. And then we can also chop it up where the Sun's gravity is most dominant, where the other planet's gravity is most dominant. There is a calculation for this, and you can look it up, uh, sphere of influence for planetary bodies. Um, but once we chop it up, that means that with our spacecraft, we're just going to calculate the gravitational influence of that main body on our spacecraft instead of calculating it for everything. Because in real life, what's happening is all the things are tugging on our spacecraft. The moon's tugging on it, the sun's tugging on it, all the planets are tugging on it, all at the same time. But then if we tried to calculate all of that, it would be a mess and very difficult. And so for basic calculations and for transferring to the moon, it is simpler to just focus on the main thing that is tugging on our spacecraft, in this case, the Earth. And until we get to uh, this point right here, where we have this moon encounter, it'll, all the calculations are based on the Earth. And then once we get to that moon encounter, once we enter the moon's sphere of influence, then all the calculations are to do with the moon. 
Uh, so that simplifies the calculations, but it's not necessarily perfectly accurate. However, for transferring to the moon, it is good enough. Uh, the, the transferring to, uh, well, I'll put a little asterisk on that for a sec there. Good enough the way we're doing it right now. Okay, so I'm going to start some fuel cells, otherwise we're going to lose power. Um, good enough for the way we're doing it right now. It is sufficient, and you can transfer the moon from Cape Canaveral like that. And even if you were trying to use in-body physics, in -body ph so this is called patched conics. Basically, we're patching uh, certain bits of the orbit. Uh, one patch is the part with the, the Earth, and our patch is the part with the moon, and we're calculating those separately. In body physics is if you're calculating all the effects of all the various uh, planets and the moon simultaneously. That's a heavy computational thing. It tends to lag things out quite a lot, uh, which is why Kerbal Space Program by default does not do it. But there is a mod that does it called Principia, and that is a whole other topic. But I have done a lunar transfer with Principia, and it's not functionally very different from what I'm doing here. If you're doing other things, though, it can get much more complicated. But the key thing is that the effect of Mercury on our spacecraft really doesn't matter much right now, or Venus or anything. Uh, we really don't need to worry about that. There is some curiosity as far as, as we get closer to the Moon, the, the effect of the Moon and the Earth is, is more complicated than the patch conic version would suggest. And certain ways of transferring to the moon take advantage of this. And in fact, more recent lunar lander missions with uh, robotic landers, not with uh, people on board, take advantage of how the moon-earth gravitational system works. And they take a while to get into moon orbit, but they take much less energy. So they might take a few months to get into lunar orbit instead of a few days. And so that's not ideal for crew, but with a robotic mission, it's fine, and they save fuel. So, yeah, in that case, you would need n-body physics. For this case, for crewed missions, often you don't. I mean, but if you want to have perfect accuracy in your simulation, then yes, though that will come at the cost of computing power. So what happened with the real Apollo missions, of course, that means that their calculations weren't based on perfect simulations. As a result, they made corrections along the way. You generally have to anyway, but they planned corrections along the way when they saw how the deviations were occurring. Okay, here we are using the APS system to turn for the node. Always make sure that you have some sort of RCS. The APS is an RCS system, just another acronym. Always make sure you have some RCS system so that you don't have to turn on your engine in order to turn. That would be a very violent maneuver. And in this case also, we may need to settle the fuel down prior to ignition. Uh, if you have a mod that requires that, it will say propellant very stable or propellant unstable there. This is a purely Kerbal Space Program thing. And if it is unstable, also the icon should change to red. And what you do is you have the thrusters fire forward in that case. If they care to, actually. Um, right now, I seem to be able to fire them forward, but okay. Well, let's hope we're properly settled. It's doing a bad job of actually pointing at the node right now. You can see the actual amount we need is 3,139 meters per second, but budgeting 3,200 should be fine. I haven't really fine-tuned the Savai. And we've got a moon periapsis there, but I didn't really get it exactly how... We could talk about a free return trajectory, you know, it's, this might not be the time for it. But let's just make sure it's on the proper side. For a free return trajectory like they did with... Uh, the early Apollo missions. Well, all the Apollo missions went on the opposite side. And that is like this. We should have reignited. So I'll just put it like this for now. Okay, that'll do. And ignition.
We will need the APS system again for when this stage has to hold itself and we do transposition and docking with the command module. But the reason why they went this way around, first of all, the free return trajectory, which means that uh, eventually that keeps your periapsis, well, keeps your orbit in Earth orbit so that you can potentially get back to Earth, though in this case we haven't done a good free return trajectory. Ideally, for the perfect trajectory, we would want the periapsis that results to be much closer to the Earth, so that's easier to get back, assuming something goes wrong. Uh, but another reason is to take advantage of the fuel in the S4B stage. Uh, going this way around, it doesn't save more delta V overall, but it can save a tiny little bit of delta V as far as the service module is concerned uh, in exchange for using more in the S4B. So we used a few meters per second more to go from an orbit going around this way to going around this way and in exchange we will save some in the service module. So just to emphasize the point we are doing this maneuver along our existing velocity vector and it is parallel to the surface of the earth even though it's in the dark is parallel to the surface of the earth we are not fighting against gravity here now, obviously if it was anything but parallel to the surface of the earth we would be fighting against gravity uh, in theory we could try and boost our orbit straight up from where we are right now but that would be horrendous that would be fighting against gravity here going parallel to the surface we're putting more energy into the orbit. And by putting more energy to the orbit, we can't, we're going faster on this end of the orbit. So we have more kinetic energy on this side. And then on the apoapsis side, the high point, we have more potential energy. And so the apoapsis side is going up. And so all it is is putting more energy into your orbit. And that leads you to go faster on this side, but not higher. And then you're getting higher on the opposite side, but that side will be slower than it used to be. It used to be that our apoapsis, we were going the same speed as our periapsis, about 7.8 kilometers per second. Now at our apoapsis, we are going to be going much slower, as we will soon see. But it will have the appropriate amount of energy, it's just the energy is measured by potential energy, which is your mass times uh, gravitational acceleration times your height. The height is the key thing here. As we get close to the end of the burn, it's sort of important to not follow the node, and so we kill rotation and shut down. We can do minor corrections. Uh, that's what corrections are for, partly. Uh, so we have 73 meters per second there. I'm not going to do the whole transposition and docking here. Uh, we're just going to have the service module do stuff on its own. We've got to abandon the lander so I don't have to do transposition and docking. So here. We're just going to have an Apollo 8 style mission now. So I'm going to correct this so that we actually have an approach to the moon. But it's a highly inclined approach right now, which is not what we really want. Okay, so we can talk about doing a make course adjustment as well at this point. So we have an inclined orbit, but let's say we really wanted to be in line with these things. There's Luna 15, there's Apollo, that's the um, ascent module for Apollo 11. Uh, it's the same save I did that in. But right now we're not in line with it. We have an inclination with it of 23 degrees. If we wanted to try and solve that or solve some other aspect of our orbit, uh, we can do a adjustment directly mid-course. So assuming you did the first burn correctly, then that would be the best place to do any sort of correction. And we flatten it out. Uh, but you see, in trying to flatten this out and decrease our relative inclination to our new target, and we can only get to about 4 degrees there, but we end up crashing into the moon, so we also have to lift our orbit up to compensate for that. So we can't necessarily correct all of the inclination to our new target, but if we can do anything, what we want to do, assuming you have a particular target around the moon, is make sure that 
your periapsis and your ascending or descending node are in the same place. That will simplify trying to meet up with it. So you're going to do this maneuver, which is only 10.5 meters per second. Could easily do that with the lunar module as well, but I just didn't want to take the time. <laughs> so service module heading out. We'll talk about landing on the moon separately another time. I want to get to the other method for getting to the moon. This maneuver is not as time sensitive as departure from low Earth orbit. So if you happen to not hit the node exactly, it should be fine still. So again, if you wanted to have a free return trajectory, this periapsis would need to be closer in. Ideally inside Earth's atmosphere. Only the earlier Apollo missions bothered to do that. The later Apollo missions did not maintain the free return trajectory. Okay, ignition. You can see the big nozzled engine here. The reason for that is this is a pressure-fed engine, so in order to get a good amount of thrust, it needs a very big nozzle. <laughs> That's just how it is. So, and a normal mission, it would be pushing not only this, but also the lunar module to land. Uh, this seems pretty good. If we were rendezvousing with this target, we'd be in a good situation. So, yep. And let me talk about how our speed is going. Uh, 1,642 now. Remember, we were close. We were past 10,000 meters per second close to the Earth, but now we are a fraction of that out here. But we are way past the radiation belts. The radiation belts end around 60,000 kilometers, uh, and we're at 171,000 already. Uh, this is uh, still on the first day. So, and we'll keep getting slower and slower as we go out. And if we actually reached our peak, we would end up going around 200 meters per second. But here we have switched frames of reference. We went from our speed relative to Earth inertial to now our speed relative to the moon. Now, relative to the moon, uh, from the Earth's point of view, we are still going slower and slower and slower. Relative to the moon, though, we're getting closer to its surface, so we're going to be going faster and faster and faster. And what's going to happen is we're going to speed up such that our orbit gets lifted up. Uh, remember, our periapsis around the Earth was still very low while we we're still in Earth orbit. Uh, so our orbit looked something like this. And so from the Earth's point of view, what we're going to do is we're on this end. We're going to burn horizontally just like we normally do. But that is going to put more energy into our orbit and lift our periapsis up so that it matches the moon's orbit. That's what Earth is seeing. What the moon is seeing is we're going too fast here. So you'll see our orbital speed go faster and faster and faster. We are going too fast to stay in the moon's orbit. We need to be at 1,600 meters per second. And when we get to the low point, we're going to be at 2,400 meters per second. You can see how much faster it builds up when we're really close. And the same for the Earth. When we're really close, we're going super fast, and it drops off dramatically. And so we need to slow down from the 2,400 meters per second to just 1,600. We have plenty of delta V for that. And we just need to sort of plan when to do this. We could also, if we were really intent on encountering this object that we've targeted, uh, so we'll plot the capture, and we can also build in the inclination correction right now. So here we can see our orbit is higher than the target's orbit, so we are going to pull down, or go south. So we're going to go south compared to where we are going otherwise. And we can also bring our orbit down. Now, if it's not convenient to th do that right now and build it into this maneuver, then it might be necessary to capture into a high orbit and correct it at the opposite end. It's easier to correct inclination at high higher altitudes. So if it turns out that this would cost too much down here, capturing into a low orbit first and then correcting it at the opposite end at the high altitude would be good. It only takes about 200 meters per second to capture into a high orbit around the moon. 
So that might be worthwhile. Anyway, we're going to do this capture first. So we're already late. And ignition. You can see, if compared to our retrograde vector, retrograde is opposite of our direction of motion so that we can slow down. If we were going on the prograde vector, the one without the x, then we're going with our existing velocity and we're going to speed up. So this is the slow down one, the one with the x. But compared to that, we are leaning a little bit south. And that is because we want to correct the relative inclination to our target. Anyway, so it's roughly about 800 meters per second that we budget for this. Uh, it would be a little bit more than 800 if we were going into a fully low orbit uh, right away. Right now we have a somewhat higher orbit. And around the moon, uh, 50 kilometer orbit is fine. So anyway, I'm not going to belabor this point. Let's just see where exactly we make orbit. You can see our curve occurring here. We have an escape. This is still based on patched conics. Whether it is an escape as far as n-body physics is concerned is a whole other story. Uh, but here we are bringing the orbit down. You can see it only took about 200 meters per second to actually make an orbit around the moon. And the rest of it is just getting the orbit down to a nice low orbit so that we can do our missions. Okay, but yeah, I'm not going to go all the way. We're going to talk about version number two of this, which is what happens if you can't really get into the moon's inclination because your launch site is not at the right inclination. So, on to Baikonur. Okay, so here we are with the proposed Soviet lunar lander mission, the N1 rocket from Baikonur. And this location is not at 28 degrees, it's at 46 degrees, let's say, north, and in fact has to launch to a 51 degree inclination. And so we can't just get into the same plane as the moon. The, we did that in-plane transfer before, which means if you can imagine a flat surface, the moon's orbit in a flat surface, we got into the same flat surface, the same plane. And this time we can't because of our location, it's always going to be out of plane. So we need to do an off-plane transfer or out-of-plane transfer. And to do that, we are going to need to make sure that the moon, when we get there, not right now, in other words, give it the lead time, when we get there is at the ascending or descending node. So where our orbit crosses the moon's orbit. So what would our orbit be if we launched right now? Well, our orbit would go up a little because we have to avoid other countries. So we're, we're all the way up here. It's really high. Uh, and then we go up and then we come back down and we'll cross the equator somewhere around here-ish. Now, so, just eyeballing it again, uh, we could sort of see if our, if we cross the equator over here, then the moon's not in the right place, it's over there. What we want is that either on this side of the orbit here or that side of the orbit there, the moon's gonna be there when we get there. So the moon should be maybe around here. Remember the 45 degree thing? So if that's where we're planning to meet up with the moon because the moon's orbit would cross our orbits right there. So it'd be a rough cross, but uh, if we make and draw an orbit line down here, we, we cross the equator and the moon crosses the Earth's equator around there-ish, then we want the moon to be 45 degrees before that. So we want the moon to be about there. What this means is, I know this is a little bit complicated, what this means is that from a place like Baikonur, we have two launch opportunities per month instead of one per day. Uh, from Cape Canaveral, we have one per day. Uh, from Baikonur, we have two per month. And one would be when the moon is over here, and the other is when the moon is over here. So uh, as it so happens, we don't have boil off on this particular launch pad. So I'm just going to straight up time warp and wait for the moon to be where I think it ought to be. We can also target the moon. Let's see. You can see the worst inclination is uh, like more than 70 degrees here. So that's a pretty severe thing. But the least, the minimum is 17-ish. But we'll try to minimize the inclination as much as possible. But I could be wrong. Once Let's uh, see about the launch and we'll see whether I'm right about this, if you will. All right. So hopefully that script is going to do everything properly. Run in one.
And it has a lot of thrust weight ratio on liftoff, the N1 rocket. No, oh, it took a while for the sound to get to us. It had engine redundancy, but I would like to point out that even with engine redundancy, it had a launch escape system, and the engine redundancy had nothing to do with whether it bumped. Not nothing to do, but uh, the success and failure was not due to engines being lost and being replaced by redundant engines, let me put it that way. Relative inclination is going up, but that, again, is because we're avoiding other countries. It could be possible to manage that a little better. We already see our ascending and descending node with respect to the moon shaping up, and it looks like maybe we're at the wrong time, but we're still sort of moving. So we'll see after a little while. Maybe eyeballing it, I didn't get quite the right timing, and we need to wait a few more days. Okay, coming close to the end of this stage. The N1 rocket used hot staging, so we expect the ignition. Okay, there we go. Just in time on the ignition and separation. That's why I had the grid between the stages. Structurally, the N1 was not a very efficient rocket. It was a very heavy rocket. So where are we right now? Well, this is getting worse and worse. I think it's because of the fact that we had to launch up that we're getting... Let me see. I think things are still sort of developing. We'll see. But we'll talk about why this is not optimal. If it turns out that we get a bad location for our sending and descending node, we'll talk about why that is not a good thing. Okay, ignition of the third stage and separation. So what has happened is I was measuring from Baikonur itself, but really where we needed to figure out the equator from is where we reach the peak of our orbit, given that we're going into a higher inclination to avoid our country's China. <laughs> China is what we're avoiding. And as a result, the moon's not going to be there. Uh, so, but we'll, I'll show you exactly what happens when you're not at the right time. And then we'll uh, revert and time warp the extra days that are necessary to bring the moon to where it needs to be. And the N1 rocket did carry the huge fairings into orbit in this case. Okay, I'm not too sure about the actual launch escape system. The top part, we're gonna let that go. That could have been released earlier, but the fairings were too huge to separate earlier. Okay, so this is a transfer stage. It does not complete orbit in this case. Now... As far as the problem of transferring when the moon is not in the right place, so there's the descending and ascending node, which is where our orbit crosses the moon's orbit. The problem is the moon is not in the right place. It needed to be over here or over here for this to work out. But let's see what happens if we try to do this in order to get our orbit where the two orbits cross so that we don't have to get into the same plane, right? Our plane is like that. The moon's plane is like that. We don't want to have to correct that because that costs a lot. We make a node a little bit ahead of the opposite node, right? Because we gotta burn up and we gotta try and meet up with it over there. We burn up. Don't actually burn up. We do a burn to lift our orbit and then we meet it. So what's the problem? Well, I mean, we can clearly meet the moon over there. The problem is that we're meeting the moon in eight days. What we're doing is in order to delay, in order to let the moon get over here, we are going higher than the moon's orbit and then coming back down. That delays because, again, the high point of our orbit is a slow part. So we're taking extra time waiting, 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 and then letting the moon catch up and then hitting it. But the result is that we take nine days to get to our moon periapsis, and we only have 12 days of food and oxygen. The water gets produced by the fuel cell. That's why we only have three days. So, yeah, we only have 12 days of supplies, so that's not going to work out very well for our mission. We won't have enough time to get back before they're out of supplies. So we want the moon to be in a position where it's still only going to take three days to get there. And so 
we need to wait. Uh, we used the wrong launch window. We need to wait another six days. So that is what we're going to do. So instead of transferring right now, I am going to uh, take a look at the date. The date is July 30th. I am going to wait six days and then we're going to launch. And then the moon will be in the right place given the fact that we need to launch into this 51 degree inclination. Let's see what the reason for our inaccuracy was. Uh, you see here is the space center. If we launched into the natural sort of inclination from Baikonur, that would cross China. We would go down this way and cross the equator like over here, but or maybe maybe over here-ish. But instead we have to go above China over here. And so we reach our peak over here and cross the equator all the way uh, all the way over here. Because we have to do that, uh, that moves our crossing point over, basically. Uh, otherwise, uh, going the natural way out of Baikonur, our crossing point would be earlier over here. But having to go up, that delays the crossing point. So we have to take in that into account. The crossing point, unfortunately, is not exactly at the equator. Uh, that would be easier, but it seems to be a little bit further south. So it's tough to judge sometimes. Uh, to eyeball, especially since we are not eyeballing a natural trajectory out. If we could sort of memorize where our the peak of our orbit will be, then we could figure out, okay, so then we could sort of line up the two orbits. So here's the moon's orbit, and then create a straight line out of both orbits, sort of see that, yes, indeed, they cross at that location. Uh, but that is something that on the fly is very difficult to do. In other words, let's say you haven't done pre-preparation. Uh, it might not be easy to figure out without NASA help. But having done this one test launch, let's say, now we know for sure that we need to wait about six days to launch. So we'll, we'll just revert and do it in six days. Uh, well, it's August 4th. I think it's okay to go now. Uh, we have once again minimized the relative inclination. That's not strictly necessary, but uh, it's helpful for precision if our or resulting orbit is not so different from the moon's orbit. Uh, it'll end up increasing anyway because we're going into a higher uh, inclination. So, But in any case, it's easier to correct things if we're not a 90 degree angle different from our target. Okay, off we go again. Okay, we are in orbit again. Let's separate off the launch escape system, the fairings, and the stage. Okay, but we just want to verify that we can make a transfer. I've already gone quite a long time on this topic, so I think I should wrap it up. Since we just talked about transferring to the moon, I'll do a moon landing in a separate video. So close to the opposite node here. And again, it'll work if the moon was closer on this side and we need to meet up up here. So two times per month. And there's our encounter. And we can shift it around to help get the peri. You can see the periapsis can get closer or further away depending on how close we do this to the ascending or descending node. But there's a minimum, and we can tweak it also by burning a little bit more. And eventually, we'll get uh, the same result, though perhaps with more inclination as we did with the Apollo mission. So we can probably get it on either side too. So here, uh, let's work on the free return. Uh, it's harder to do the free return out of Baikonur than from the Cape, but it still should be possible. Here, what we're doing is we're ending up lifting our orbit here. Uh, if I tweaked it perfectly, we should be able to get it just fine. But we get the timing exactly right and everything for the transfer burn. It'll be okay. 
There we would be in the atmosphere and to take a trivial amount to correct it. But you can see we're far away from the moon here. Uh, that's potentially all right. Uh, so this is the free return. What, me what it means is if everything else goes wrong, the capsule would still return back to Earth just fine with minor corrections with the RCS system without any major burns. Normally, uh, they would initially be on this trajectory and then make a minor course correction in the middle here so that once everything seemed all right, we could bring that back down and it wouldn't cost much to make that change. And later, Apollo missions didn't bother with the free return initially, but had the possibility of getting back onto the free return later, as was necessary for Apollo 13. But you can see the maneuver in the middle there, 36.5 uh, meters per second, not degrees. 36.5 meters per second is fairly minor, um, even though we are uh, approaching the moon at a fairly uh, inclined sort of situation, uh, we get sort of the same approach that we had with Apollo. We could get into a polar orbit as well, that's not much different, but we can do this too. Uh, the polar orbit can be managed if we adjust it at the mid-course maneuver, so it's like that. It's very simple. The mid-course maneuver is really critical as you can see, and can get you into many different situations around the moon. So, and for very little cost, uh, 67 is a little bit, uh, we could probably fix that a little bit better. Anyway, so that's the off-plane transfer, where you transfer at one of the nodes, the ascending and descending node, which is where your orbit crosses the target's orbit in general. So even if it wasn't the moon, it could be something else. As long as your orbit crosses the target's orbit there, you can do that transfer. And the key is to make sure that the, the target is going to reach the node that you're trying to hit it at in time so that it doesn't take too long. Now these are not the only methods of transferring to the moon. Uh, like I said, with n-body physics you can do some fancy stuff that I can't even discuss properly. So that is beyond me. Uh, Alright, I think I'll wrap it up here. If there are any other questions about how to get to the moon, I can answer them. But next time, perhaps we will talk about how to land on the moon. So with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.